from Hollywood, the Hollywood Radio Theater. Starring June Haver and Jack Carson in Trouble Along the Way with Sherry Jackson. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Irving Cummings. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight we will tell you the story of a football coach faced with some extraordinary problems. How to build a team that can save a small college from bankruptcy. Maintain the proper environment for a small daughter and avoid falling in love with a severely beautiful social worker. Well, fortunately, the problems all add up to a laugh-provoking romance. And we have one of the loveliest girls in Hollywood, June Haver co-starring with that expert comedian, Jack Carson, in this Warner Brothers screen hit, Trouble Along the Way. Now, act one of Trouble Along the Way, starring June Haver as Alice Singleton and Jack Carson as Steve Williams, with Sherry Jackson as Carol. I suppose I'd pass the place a hundred times before I even knew what it was. The mossy old walls, the quaint, sagging buildings, the ivory-covered tower. Well, finally, I asked a taxi driver. Why, that's a college, lady. St. Anthony's College. College? There ain't another one like it in the world. There ain't no college nowhere as broken down as this college. Why, it must be the oldest college in New York City. Uh Uh-uh. It just looks that way. Mm, But it's beautiful. Those lovely iron gates and that wonderful tower with the clock. The clock is on all four sides, see? Yes, I know. Only each side's got a different time. Oh, that's some college lady. (laughs) You can't even learn the time of day. Poor St. Anthony's. Shabby, neglected, completely out of place in the city that surrounded it. The city, incidentally, was my boss. I worked for the Court of Domestic Relations. And quite often, my job took me near St. Anthony's. One day, I even saw an automobile drive in. What we're trying to say, Father Burke, is that, uh, well, Brother Procurator and I have come here directly from a meeting of the province advisors. They're upset about the indebtedness of your little college. Over $170,000, Father. And you don't seem to be doing anything to decrease it? Well, George, when I take a vow of poverty, I go all the way. Well, it appears you've been going a little too far. You see, Father, St. Anthony's College is going to close its doors. Close? I'm sure you'll find it's all for the best, Father. But I... I can't leave St. Anthony's. Why, I've been here as a student, a professor, and as Father Rector for... for more than 50 years. I'm sorry, Father, but the decision has been made. Uh, Unless you suddenly find $170,000... Meanwhile, you'll finish the term, of course, but try to keep expenses down. Well, goodbye, Father. Now, don't worry, Father. We're certainly not going to put you out to pasture. And God bless you. Uh, Goodbye, goodbye. Oh, uh, don't trip on that step going down. That board was loose when I was a student here. This place is nothing but a fire trap. If I had my way, we'd close it down immediately. Is that so? Well, we'll just see about that. We'll see about that indeed. That evening, Father Burke gave a little talk to the student body, after which he went to his office, followed by his two assistants, Father Peterson and Father Malone. That was an excellent speech, Father Burke, excellent. Thank you, Leonard. But you just told those boys this college will still be here when their grandchildren are flunking out. We understood the college was ordered closed. Only if we fail to solve our financial problem. A mere matter of money. Oh, that old stuff again, huh? I know exactly how I shall meet the situation, and as usual, I'll meet it single-handed. And just how do you intend to get $170,000? I found the answer in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy? Chapter 32, verse 15. Chapter 32, eh? Verse 15. Well, is there a Bible in the house, or do you have to go to a hotel? (laughs) I'll see you both in the morning. Hmm. Chapter 32, verse 15. Yeah, here we are, the... The beloved grew fat and kicked. What did you say? 
the beloved grew fat and kicked. Now, what do you suppose Father Burke meant by that? To Father Burke, the meaning was entirely obvious. Football, what else? The next day, after visiting a couple of prominent coaches, Father Burke found himself in a rather seamy section of the east side. He was looking for a man named Steve Williams. Sure I know where he is. Only what do you want with him? I have a position to offer him. He's a little old for an altar boy, but you look harmless. Uh, appearances can be very deceiving, but thank you anyway. That's Steve chalking up his cue. He's got a sucker on the hook. Thank you, little girl. Uh, Mr. Williams. Good morning. I hate to interrupt your game. Ah. But... Oh, darn it. I'm oh, sorry. That's nothing, Father. Only 75 cents a ball. I'm Father Burke, St. Anthony's College. Oh, a little off your beat, aren't you? I don't think so. I'm looking for an experienced football coach. I understand you used to be one of the best. Who told you? You have friends. Friends who want to save my soul and get us out of this unwholesome atmosphere? Us? He's my pop. Uh, oh. Well, I, I have a school that's in financial difficulty. That's my only reason for coming to you. Well, I'm afraid you're a little out of touch. I've been kicked out of the Big Ten, the Ivy League, the Southern Conference. They, they wouldn't even let me coach at Alcatraz. <laughs> I know all about that. The offer still holds. Thanks, but I, I like it here. Very few alumni can come back and tell me how to hold this cue. Do I detect a note of bitterness? Yes, you do indeed. Now, in case you don't know it, Father, football is now an American industry. The price of a good running back often surpasses the salary of a professor. And whenever some righteous committee unearths this well-known fact, it's always the coach who takes it on the chin. I, I just got tired of picking myself up. Three ball in a side pocket, Steve. Go ahead. Six balls a hanger, Pop. Thanks, Junior. Do I got to play the whole family? <laughs> uh, Mr. Williams, you mustn't judge St. Anthony's by the standards of other schools. I'm willing to take a chance on you. Well, the, the trouble with us, Father, is that I'm a sensitive man and you're a gambler. <laughs> no, thanks. Rack, boy. Rack. I take my advice and stay out of sports. You'd be a babe in the woods. I'll rack the balls for you if I may. Huh? Pop! Pop, look! He's doing it with his arms. No rack. Where did you ever learn how to do that? The father's a ringer. Um, I also play a very good game of Kelly Pool, Mr. Williams. If you should change your mind. <laughs> now, you're quite a guy. Uh, yes, aren't I? <laughs> Well, that's how Father Burke met Steve Williams. Now, how do I figure in all of this? Well, that dismal event occurred early the following day when I, too, came searching for Mr. Williams, but on a much different sort of errand. It's for you, Pop. Just brush her off and eat your breakfast. Thanks, Junior. Well? I'm Miss Singleton from the Children's Division of the Court of Domestic Relations. I've been assigned to investigate you and your child with regard to her environment and educational standing. Oh, excuse me. Carol, the deadline for school is in exactly ten and one quarter minutes. Now finish your breakfast inside and get going. Talk loud, Pop, so I can hear. As for you, Miss, please don't use the word child with such chilling precision. Her name is Carol. You seem to be very particular about everything except an untidy room and dirty dishes. Well, the, the butler was late today. <laughs> you know, I'm beginning to wonder whether I'll get a fair shake of this investigation. Oh, I'm completely impartial, but I... I'm almost certain my report will have to be unfavorable. Huh? Before you get to know me? Well, I interviewed the child's teachers and neighbors before coming here. My neighbors knock me? Quite the contrary. But they're scarcely the sort of people I would choose for character references if I were you. Well? Well, the court has received a complaint that your child is being neglected. You mind telling me who filed this complaint? Hmm, I believe it was your former wife. Why is she so interested all of a sudden? There's no reward. Y you pipe down. We don't talk about my mother around here. She's been annulled. <laughs> Mrs. McCormick is worried that you're not getting the proper care, honey. And I must say, it appears that you have some grounds. Honestly, officer, I'm the nicest father a kid ever had. Carol, show the lady how nicely the welts are healing where I beat you. And those new teeth you bought me are just as good as the old ones, see? Sure, and we only hold up gas stations once a week and then in the daytime. It isn't as if I kept the kid up after hours. If you don't mind, Mr. Williams, we'll continue this discussion without the presence of the child. Uh, uh, go get your books. 
Steve, do I have to? I'll holler if I need help. You should have hollered before you got married. No. <laughs> May I have your occupation, please? May I, uh... I'm a tycoon. What? Well, as I understand it, a tycoon is a man who has far-flung financial operations. Now, during football season... I get out a little card which gives my estimates of the worth of the various college teams. If your estimate is better than mine, I pay as high as five to one. During baseball season, I do the same thing. Of course, I I've given up basketball in order to maintain the high ethical standard of my firm. But you can still get action on the prize fights, hockey, and the nine ball in the corner pocket. I'm a tycoon. Hmm. If there were any real attachment between you and your child, I would think you'd make every effort to convince the court that you're a fit parent. <laughs> You're way off base. Miss Single and Carolyn and I are okay. It's you who needs the help. Really? You know all about me, hmm? Well, uh, let me guess. Let's see now. Four years at finishing school, one year at the new school for social research, uh, no love life because you're afraid of it, one of the generation of young old maids. Mr. Williams, also... when I first walked in here, my sympathies were not entirely with that poor child's mother. But now, I'm going to do everything I can to take Carol away from these awful surroundings and, and from your degrading influence. Hmm? You got nice legs, too. <laughs> All clear, Pop? Yep. Steve, why don't we go to a ball game? A ball game? When did you burn down the school? Okay. But I'm only doing this for you. Thanks, pal. Here. Have a good lunch. Be seeing you, Pop. <laughs> I considered it my duty to check on Mr. Williams' activities for the balance of the day. Oh, what an impossible man. In any event, at about one o'clock, he entered a third-rate saloon on 2nd Avenue. Uh, hello, Steve. Hmm? Oh. Hello, Anne. I've been waiting for you. The bartender said you're here every day. That's right. This is one of my branch offices. <laughs> you look startled. I guess five years is a long time. Not long enough. Well, aren't you going to ask a former wife to take a seat? Go ahead. You've taken everything else. <laughs> well, I, uh, I came by to talk about visiting privileges. Look, I've told your lawyer a dozen times, I wouldn't let you see Carol for five minutes. Oh, but you don't understand. I want you to visit me. You know, that's one thing I've always liked about you, Anne. No razzle-dazzle. Always straight through the middle. What, uh, what about your latest husband? Well, Harold can still raise me to the heights with his checkbook. Oh, now, look, there's no reason for a legal mess about the kid. All you have to do is be nice to me. Go home. It's very cold at home. You may build a fire under someone, but not me. Don't walk out on me twice, Steve. You don't stand a prayer. You come back here. All right, I'll get that kid away from you if it takes every lawyer in New York. You just watch. You just watch. I can't say whether Mr. Williams was aware that I was following him or not. All I know is that he got away from me. And just to make matters worse, when I returned to their flat late that afternoon, Mr. Williams and his daughter had disappeared. Meanwhile, at St. Anthony's College... I just don't understand him, Father Peterson. I'm sure Father Burke is trying to do the best he can, but these strange notions he's getting about football teams... Well, after all, when you get to be Father Burke's age... Yeah. You... Pardon me, gentlemen. Oh. Might I totter by? Oh, good evening, Father. We were just talking about you. Any news? We have not as yet been invited to the Rose Bowl. Well, you tried your best, Father. No one belittles you for it. We just love you all the more. Peterson, is it true that before you took the holy orders, you were a used car salesman? <laughs> Father Bird. Now, if you'll pardon me, I was told I have a visitor in my office. Uh, that's about it, Father Bird. Carol here and I, well, we, uh, we talked it over and we decided to give it a whirl. Oh, we're very grateful to have you with us, Mr. Williams. I imagine you look upon St. Anthony's as a last desperate resort. Mm hmm The bottom of the ivy-covered barrel, Father, but... If you're willing to take a chance, so am I. Well, you're our last resort, too. You have six months in which to help us save our little school. I trust you will do it with honor and integrity. What's the salary, Father? I believe that by skimping a little on our budget, we, uh, we might afford, say, $3,000 a year. Who'll buy us whistle? 
You keep out of this. It's a deal, Father. Your daughter will be gratified to learn that we supply room and board free of charge, such as it is. Let's just get it down on paper, huh? <laughs> that's, uh, that's her religion, Father. I'll draw up a contract. I presume, little girl, you are also a notary public? <laughs> <laughs> what a character. <laughs> Act two of Trouble Along the Way in a moment. You know, our servicemen overseas have a wonderful opportunity to observe new customs and traditions. And they find, too, that these ideas of other people aren't so strange after all. And take, for instance, the use that man has made of animals. You see teams of oxen in Italy and southern France. Donkeys are both uh, transportation and beasts of burden in Spain. Buffalo are the domestic animals of Iran and the Near Eastern countries. Camels in Africa, the elephant of India, and dog teams in Alaska. Well, when you understand the reasons behind the use of these animals, it doesn't seem strange that they should be used in other countries. Why camels in Africa? Well, because in spite of their bad tempers, they're well equipped for desert travel. Eyelids that keep out the sand, stomachs that can store up water for a long journey. Why dogs in Alaska? Because they're meat eaters. Ideal for a country with little vegetation. Why oxen in Italy? Because their strong muscles enable them to do heavy work that would, well, would literally kill a horse. These people are as fond of their animals as the American farmer is of his pedigreed bull or his prize-winning sow. The same is true of other customs and traditions in all countries. The way of doing things may be different, but the ideals are the same. These customs are important to the people who follow them. Our servicemen are helping to maintain goodwill by observing the customs of other people in other lands. Now our producer, Mr. Cummings. Act two of Trouble Along the Way, starring June Haver as Alice and Jack Carson as Steve, with Sherry Jackson as Carol and Herb Butterfield as Father Burke. And so Steve Williams became football coach of St. Anthony's College. At the time, of course, I knew nothing of this. I was still looking for him, while he, as I later discovered, was looking for a football team. You really have a football team here, kid? Oh, sure, Mr. Williams. You go to the games? Oh, I have to, sir. I'm the captain. <laughs> the captain, huh? What, uh, what do you weigh? 129, sir. Without my glasses. <laughs> Thick lenses, huh? Now I'll show you our playing field, Mr. Williams. It's right out this door. Uh-huh. There you are. Quite adequate, I believe. Father Malone, this is the field? Mm -hmm. Dandy little layout, huh? Uh-huh. When do you pick the strawberries? <laughs> this way, boys. Everyone over here, please. What, uh, what system do you use, Father? Do unto others as you would have others do unto you, but uh, usually the others do it to us first. Oh. <laughs> Well, fellows, I want you to meet your new coach. He's going to take over the spring training. This is Steve Williams, boys, who's coached at some of the country's leading universities. For short intervals. And we're very happy to have him with us here at St. Anthony. Wait a minute. Anybody here know how to kick a football? Oh, I do the kicking, coach. Yeah, well, you get out there and get off some punts. You backs receive. The linemen can practice blocking. All right, now, all of you, get out there. Okay, all right, let's go, fellas. Uh... Father, how did you do last season? Oh, pretty well. We showed up for every game. <laughs> Just raw courage, eh? Well, what are you waiting for? You have our ball, sir. It's the only one we have. Huh? Oh, oh here. And don't bruise it. This it, Pop? This where we're going to live? Yeah, this... This is it, honey. Up here at the top of the chapel tower. Father Peterson said we have a very fine view. Oh, brother, those stairs. I wonder who lived here last. Who else? The hunchback of Notre Dame. <laughs> How was school today? Oh, fine. How was football today? Just keep in training, kid. I'm going to need you at left guard. Bunch of bums, huh? Well, at least they're willing bums. Pop, I'm sorry I got you into this. I'll go to bed. Why don't we blow? Because the court's going to be looking for us, and when they find us, 
I want a better address than the pool room. Don't I give you the creeps? Sleeping in a chapel after taking their three grand? Now, you look. This is a musical comedy college, and nobody can save it except Rogers and Hammerstein. I couldn't help them if I wanted to. Now, go to bed. Steve. Yeah? Anne couldn't really take me away from you, could she? Now, look, honey. Why don't you quit trying to carry the world around on your shoulders? You're only 11 years old. At least wait until you're 12. <laughs> Just stop worrying about the school and the church and taking their money. It's not going to spoil my sleep. I'm so tired that I... Pops, <laughs> what's that? Chapel bells. It seems we're right under them. Guess that was 10 o'clock, huh? Yeah, now go to sleep. We've got a solid 59 minutes to repent it. Well, I finally ran down Mr. Williams about a month later. He was out on the football field. I waited until they were through practicing. All right, all right, good, good, good. Wait, wait, oh, so it's you. Well, welcome to St. Anthony's, officer. I must say, your change of address is quite an improvement. But you neglected to notify the court. Oh, I'm sorry. It was strictly an oversight, of course. Apparently, my little visit had some effect on you. You'd be surprised what effect it had. I'm going to find it hard to resist an officer from now on. <laughs> Now, if you would just take a sensible viewpoint regarding Mrs. McCormick's visitation... No, no, I... not a chance. Mr. Williams, why are you so stubborn about Carol's mother? Stubborn guy, I guess. Comes natural. I didn't mean to pry. I, I just hoped for more information so I'd have a better understanding of the situation. Well, you leave me no choice but to report in favor of Mrs. McCormick's complaint. I understand. Uh, no uh, hard feelings. None. Goodbye. I'll try to... Well? May I ask what this is? It's a whiskey bottle. I keep it there on the bench. Well, now, how can you possibly set this kind of example in front of those boys? You have a very wicked and suspicious nature, Miss Singleton. That whiskey bottle is filled with liniment. Oh. I shall light a candle for you. <laughs> Steve. Oh, hello, Father Malone. I, uh, was eavesdropping, Steve. I'm sorry. I should have left when she started to talk to you. Oh, that's okay, Father. Forget it. I just want you to know I'm sure you would not have kept Carol unless you knew she was better off with you. Carol's mother is just no good, Father. I may not be much better myself, but I, I just can't let her take that kid. Now, let me speak to Father Burke. I'm sure if he knew no, about no, it... No, 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 we... nothing doing. Whatever you've heard this afternoon is strictly between us. I want your word on it. Very well, Steve, if that's what you want. Yeah. Things will work out in one way or another. They always do. <laughs> Good morning, Father Burke. Ten o'clock? Aren't you a little late for school, Carol? Well, well, yes. That's the way I look at it, too. So I figured I'd go up to Yankee Stadium. Oh? Then what are they teaching up there? Yanks versus Cleveland. It's a crucial. Uh, Carol, I want to talk to you. The, the truant officer called on me yesterday. He seemed a little upset. Well, if I had to chase kids for a living, I couldn't sleep nights either. <laughs> Carol, I'm sure your father wants you to have an education. What did it ever do for him? He worked his way through college. For what? So he could coach football here at, at Bankrupt U? I was hoping he'd help us change all that. In six months? It takes four years to get a decent schedule. Four years? If the big clubs will book you at all. <laughs> Gee, I thought everybody knew that. Well, now you see. If you don't go to school, you might grow up to be as ignorant as I am. Look, Father, the way I see it, all you have to do is learn how to add so you can figure out when people are cheating you. I add pretty good. Now, you know something? I've spent 60 years of my life in schools, and I can't add at all. Now, if you'll excuse me, I just remembered I have a very important engagement. Well, that's okay, Father. See you in church. <laughs> Cardinal was visiting New York for such a short time. You really should have had an appointment. I know, I know, but a matter has come up suddenly. I thought perhaps you might be able to squeeze me in. Uh, what about those reservations for Chicago? Uh, yes, Your Eminence. Everything has been taken care of. Father Burke. Well, why didn't you tell me he was out here? We didn't want to disturb you, Your Eminence. You're in New York so seldom. Now, why all the formality, Father? This doesn't sound like the man who failed me in English history. 
I was merely adopting the reverential tone customary with your high office, and if you had any real dignity, you'd expect it. <laughs> now, that's the Father Burke I used to know. Uh, may we drop you anyway, Father? We, we were just leaving. Uh, we have room in the car, haven't we? I'll sit on the jump seat. I failed in English history, too. <laughs> Father Burke, I, I feel just as badly as you do about the passing of St. Anthony's, but that's entirely in the provincial's hands. I can't interfere. But if we could make St. Anthony's pay its own way? Well, in that case, it'll be a pleasure to help the provincial see the light. Uh, what is your Machiavellian plan? Well, my staff looks upon it as another indication of my senility. Are you familiar with the game of football? That brutal sport? Well, many universities aid themselves financially by engaging it. Indeed. I'd hope to do the same, but... Do you know it takes four years to get a decent schedule if the big clubs will book you at all? Well, now, how can I be of assistance? Well, uh, I thought perhaps you might drop a gentle hint to some of our larger institutions to look favorably upon the plight of St. Anthony's. To have them uh, book you? Well, I... Uh, I really shouldn't have asked. I'll do anything I can for you. I'll see how much influence I really have. Excuse me, Your Eminence, but we've arrived. I'll leave you then. Oh, no, 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 Father. You're, you're our guest. Hmm? Well, where are we? Yankee Stadium. Cleveland's playing. Ought to be a splendid game, Father. Naturally. It's a... a crucial... <laughs> Well, by the time commencement exercises were held, Father Burke was able to announce the fall football schedule. And now I'm sure you will all be interested in a recent communication from His Eminence, the Cardinal. He has written the following. My dear Father Burke, concerning my recent appointment as graduate manager of athletics for St. Anthony's College, I am happy to report the following schedule for next fall. September 20th, Santa Carla University, <coughs> September 27th, Holy Cross, October 4th, Villanova, October 7th, at South Bend, the University of Notre Dame. But, Father Malone, Mr. Williams, what is it? Are you ill? Couldn't he have booked one Protestant school just for a breather? <laughs> Surely you'll reconsider. Yes, Absolutely, indeed. I'm leaving town. I won't be a party to this homicide. Why, with the material you have here at St. Anthony's, you couldn't whip Vassar at Tiddlywinks. You flipped your lids. Sure, you have a schedule, but what about players? Oh, players. Yeah. Right now, we've got 15 boys playing football who ought to be practicing their ping pong. We need a squad of at least 40. They've got to be big. They've got to be strong. They've got to have experience. Isn't that up to you, Mr. Williams? I've told you we're giving you an absolutely free hand. Then you'd better shake it right now, because I'm leaving. Nice to have known you, gentlemen. Oh. So we're leaving, huh? Where are we going, Pop? As far as our bankroll will take us. Upstate, where we can hide away from our little friend from the probation bureau. Do we know anybody up there? Uh-huh. I got a friend in Rochester. He owns a bar and a grill. Pool room attached? Sure. No? What's the matter? Nothing. You know, St. Anthony's got a schedule now that any school would be proud of. Yeah, including the matter on home for the feeble-minded. Oh, but you have all summer to get ready. Three months to build up that kind of a team, we'd be slaughtered. But the sports writers, writers would like it, though. They could put me in the funny papers right next to little Abner. If you could do it, though. If you just could do it. Hey, you're beginning to sound like a member of the order. Pop, please. Honey, be sensible. You know football. How could I possibly get a... Hey, you're pretty happy here, huh? Uh-huh. You want to stay here? Uh-huh. Okay, Junior. If that's the way you want it. Oh, thanks. A couple of days later, Steve Williams was in the athletic office of a very large university up in New England. He went there to talk to two old friends. I'd like to help you out, Steve, but I got a great set up here, backfield coach. And I got a four-year deal to coach a line. Okay, okay, fellas. I just thought I'd sound you out. I wouldn't want to take you away from your soft touch here. Uh, hey, these, uh, these your files, Luce? Yeah, 
Hmm. We got a report in these files on every prep and high school kid who has kicked the ball over 10 yards. And the name of the kid who caught it. Hmm. I wonder how many of these kids I could nail down. No, oh, they've already been nailed, the good ones. They'll get loose when they hear my offer. What'll that be? Room and board? No, nah, there's going to be no employer-employee relationships at St. Anthony's. Everybody's going into business for himself. Yeah, what's the deal? Well, at my new alma mater, they don't even know what, the t- what time it is. After All they're after are gate receipts. So? So we're going to cut up all the angles for ourselves. Parking, programs, hot dogs, advertising, pennants, pay washrooms. Everybody's going to be a member of the firm and split the profits. This will be the first cooperative football team in history. Hey, ain't that socialism? Uh, Not if we can get in on it. But, boys, I thought you were so happy here. Look, just for once, we'd like to make as much as the players. (laughs) And let's get to work and clean out those files. Oh, Steve, no, we we can't swipe them files. This is the Ivy League. Please, I live upstairs from a church. (laughs) Just hand me a box to dump men. All right, Moose, now, uh, what about this one? He sure looks good in this photograph. We got him, Steve. I signed him up yesterday. All state tagless, says. Oh, of course, he didn't graduate. Then we'll print him a diploma. Oh, uh, looks like we got everything but a passer. Well, uh, what happened to that kid from Scranton? One of the California schools got him first. Yeah, I think they made his old man vice president of a bank. Yeah. Hey, there's a good passer in the Canadian League. Huh? Miller? Oh, now, look, take it easy, Steve. He's a pro. Give him a crew haircut and sign him. Check now, remember, we can't just win our first game. We're going to have to roll up a big score. We won't draw flies. And how do you roll up a big score against Santa Carla, number one on the West Coast? Summer school. Summer school? Our own brand. Eight classes a day, all football. Yeah. You see, Santa Carla, Notre Dame, and Holy Cross can't practice in the summertime. Conference rules. That gives us a three-month jump on them. By September, we ought to be able to take on the Chicago Bears, even if they use real bears. <laughs> We may fade in the stretch, gentlemen, but brother will thump them in those openers. Uh Uh-huh. And what happens if our boys don't want to give up their summers for training? They'll train all right. We're getting them only because they want to make some money. Big money. We don't have a squad of college boys. We got a squad of stockholders. Hail to alma mater. Hail! All hail to thee! (laughs) Shortly after World War II... Some army officers in the Philippines took the time and trouble to find out that their houseboy had one burning ambition, one desire in life, and that was to come to the United States and study for the Baptist ministry. Well, they took it upon themselves to do a lot of corresponding and arranging, and they finally obtained a four-year scholarship for him at Eastern New Mexico College. Then the Woman's Missionary Union heard about the boy, and they offered him a two-year seminary scholarship. But there was still a mighty important question, the question of raising $440 for his passage to the United States. And it was in an army chapel that Catholic, Protestant, and Jewish servicemen joined together to collect the funds so that this boy might become a Baptist minister. Such acts by you and your friends today are shaping our world of tomorrow. We pause now for station identification. The curtain rises on Act Three of Trouble Along the Way, starring June Haver as Alice and Jack Carson as Steve, with Sherry Jackson as Carol and Herb Butterfield as Father Burke. By the following September, the moss-covered walls of St. Anthony's College were hiding one of the biggest, toughest football teams in the country, and potentially the best paid. But so far, no one seemed to know the difference. Then a week before the opening game, Steve received a letter from the city of New York. It brought him quickly downtown to see me. Uh, How come you suggested this place? This, Miss Singleton, happens to be a saloon. Mm, I thought we could talk more comfortably in a place better suited to your manners. (laughs) (laughs) Now drink your highball. It'll quiet your nerves. You're actually showing signs of being human. Now, now look. I know we're going to have to fight you when the custody hearing comes up in court, but what's this all about, this letter you people sent me? 
It means you have to let Carol see her mother on September the 20th, or else you're in contempt of court. That's next Saturday. Yes, Mrs. McCormick insisted. She said that was the most convenient time. I'm glad she still reads the sports pages. That's the day of our first game. Mr. Williams, <clears throat> aren't there more important things in Carol's life than football? Not next Saturday, they aren't. Oh, this is just peachy, isn't it? If I make Carol go see her mother, then I'm a heel. If I don't, I'm in contempt of court. It's the old squeeze play. Well, that's one way of looking at it. What other way is there? It's just possible that Carol will find a whole new world that you've kept her from. How do you know your way of raising your daughter has been right? Because I ask her. That's the best way. How many pink dresses does she have? Huh? And how many hats you can't play baseball in? And, and what happens when she stops being a little girl and becomes a young lady? Now, are you preparing her to meet those problems? Oh. Uh -huh. I'll call for Carol at 11 o'clock Saturday morning. Pop, how come you're still up here in the room? The buses are leaving for the polo ground. Listen, Carol, uh, you're, uh, you're not going to the game. What are you talking about? Well, you have to see your mother today. Alice is coming by to pick you up. Alice? Uh, yeah, Miss Singleton. You're kidding, huh? No, no, they have a court order. Even you can't fight City Hall. But today, the first game, how could you let them do a thing like that? Well, a lot of things more important in your life than football. You didn't even put up a fight? Now quit yapping and take a gander at this. I got something for you. What? A time bomb. What else? <laughs> well, how do you like it? A pink dress, huh? Uh-huh. I like it fine. Only... Only I want to go to the game. Pa, please. I want to go to the game. Oh, now, put on the dress, honey. She'll be waiting for you downstairs. Look, stay out of trouble and, and kick on third down. Okay? Okay. But I still think you're a stinker. So I took Carol to her mother's. I decided to wait around. By 2 o'clock, Carol had all she could take. As a matter of fact, so had I. We reached the polo grounds in plenty of time for the kickoff. And there, right on the 50-yard line, was Father Burke. Hey, you are, Father Burke. This robe should keep you nice and warm. Thanks for tucking me in. Next thing I know, you'll be burping me. Good. Look who's coming, Father. Brother Procurator and Father Provincial. Afternoon, Ed. Good afternoon, Father. What? I see you got the tickets I sent you. Oh, yes. They're splendid seats. And only $4.80 apiece. Well, you said the college had to pay its way, or did you hope for professional courtesy? I understand the crowds continue only as long as the team is winning. Well, all our boys went to mass this morning. So did Santa Carla. Yes, but ours outweigh them. Excuse me, brother, it appears the game has started. Oh, who has the ball? The enemy. Smite them, boys! Smite them hip and thigh! Oh, they smited them all right. By the time the fourth quarter started, St. Anthony's was leading 20 to nothing. We're swapping them. We're murdering them. Yes, dear, that's quite a team your father has. Quite a team. But didn't you tell me they were all freshmen? Well, in a way. Let's just say they're working their way through college. Well, I'll bet there isn't a coal miner left in Pennsylvania. Hey, Finky, how's business? Great, kid. They're eating them like they didn't know concerned. what was in them. Is he a friend of yours? Yeah, he's selling hot dogs. Like Steve says, every penny counts. You see that? Chucky's made a first down. Uh, hey, how come you're not cheering? You think I should? I'm not being paid, you know. Uh-oh. Well, how do you expect Steve to win games? With Father Burke at quarterback? Is winning so important, Carol? Hey, whose side are you on, Alice? Anne's side or Pop's side? I'm on your side, Carol. Thanks, I think. St. Anthony's won the game, 28 to nothing. After the game, Carol took me down to the field. Hiya, Junior. How'd you get out? Who sprung you? Alice. She couldn't take it either. Huh? Well, that's, that's very decent of you. Not at all. I've learned a great deal today. First about Carol's mother and then about you. Well, I, I always figured you had possibilities. When... When can I see you again? Wednesday morning in court. Hmm? Goodbye, Carol. Goodbye, Alice. And thanks. I don't like the way she said that. Me neither. Sorry, Pop. But I guess I spilled some beans. Come 
Come in, Mr. Williams. Sit down. Uh, sorry I kept you waiting, Father Burke. Well, I, I just got the final count of the profits from Saturday's game. $31,000 in round figures, and they're going to get rounder and rounder. Now, take a look at this. Advanced sales in the Holy Cross game. There isn't going to be any Holy Cross game. Yeah. What? We've just canceled the entire schedule. Oh, I see. I... The day of reckonings arrived early. Well, how about it? It won't be the last you'll experience either. Do you mind telling me who opened up your eyes? I mind indeed. It's okay. I I think I know anyway. What made you think you could save St. Anthony's by destroying the very things it stands for? I've already asked the provincial to close our school immediately. I'm sorry, Father. The thing that hurt most was to hear from a stranger that you've been buying players, forging records, dividing profits and laughing at those of us who were not even enough to have confidence in you. That you've even allowed a professional football player to wear the venerable colors of St. Anthony's. Elmer Miller of the Canadian Professional League. Elmer Miller happens to be a kid who spent his last high school year in Korea. Combat medals from here to there. He comes home and plays one chintzy backwoods game. And what's the difference whether the kids make money on the hot dogs in the parking or some alumnus gets the concession? I've been through this so many times, Father. It's like old home week. So let's just call it quits, huh? I want you to know this, though. I'm not ashamed of anything I've done. There's enough shame in me for both of us. Good day, Mr. Williams. Why, Mr. Williams? Mm hmm? But this office is officially closed for the night. Well... What do you want? Miss Singleton, you've accomplished the following. Carol will be taken away from me. Father Burke's heart will be broken because St. Anthony's will be closed. And you've cheated some 40 kids out of an education they can't afford unless there's football. All because I looked at your legs. You've been drinking. And in the best Christian tradition, I'm going to return good for evil. Now, here's some advice. Singleton, start winking at strange men. Drop your gloves anytime you're in an elevator with an eligible bachelor. Go boat riding with lonesome sailors. Get out of town. Let life rub against you, and then maybe some man will do this to you. Don't you dare kiss me. I just did. That's what you wanted, isn't it? But to make up for it, you do clever little things like running to Father Burke, telling him my boy's sullied the good name of his school. I did not go to Father Burke. No? No. But you've had me all figured out from the beginning, haven't you? Four years at finishing school. I went to City College night. And I don't have to tell stories about you to hurt you, Mr. Williams. You're hurting yourself. Anything that I've done was to protect Carol. Protect her from what? From growing up like me. I had a wonderful father, too. Real pals we were, man to man about everything. I hardly ever realized I was a girl. By the time I was ten, I was a misfit. When I was twelve, I hated every boy who'd ever laughed at me. It was a big club. Do you know this is the first time in my life I've ever let a man get close to me? Now get out of here. Yes, sir? Is Mrs. McCormick in? Is she expecting you, sir? I paid two bucks for an invitation 12 years ago. <laughs> what are you doing here? I surrender, dear. Get out. Everybody tells me to get out. No, no, not, not until I've talked to you. Well, be quick about it. We have guests inside. Well, I'm giving Carol up. Congratulations. How touching. Well, maybe it's best for her. I, I, I see no sense dragging her through a court trial tomorrow. I'll, I'll send her away to a good school somewhere. And you expect me to agree to that? Why not? You don't want her. You got tired of her before she was two months old. You're only giving her up because you know you're lit. I want you to bring Carol into court. I want her to hear all about her fine, upstanding father. Have you seen the probation report? Yes, Williams. You should have been nicer to dear Miss Singleton. Relax, Harold. I can handle this character. Incidentally, Steve, now that I've told Father Burke the facts about life and football, your brand in particular, you couldn't get custody of a cocker spaniel. Don't take all the credit, darling. I dialed the number, didn't I? Oh, you did, did you? You know, Williams, I'm not overly fond of having your daughter in my house. I hope you realize what a sacrifice I'm making. But I see no reason why Carol should grow up to be the same kind of tramp that you are. What? Just add it to the other charges, Annie. I'll see you in court. Now, just one moment, Mr. Williams. 
I happen to be the judge of this court, and I'll conduct the proceedings exactly as I see fit. All I was trying to do, Your Honor, you was to... You heard say... the judge shut up. Uh, Carol. Yes, sir? Perhaps you'd better wait in my chambers. We don't like a child to see how foolish adults can be. It isn't exactly a secret, Your Honor. I might as well stay. Very well. Counsel for Mrs. McCormick will continue. I should like to read the concluding paragraph of the probation officer's report. It is my opinion that the father has a degrading influence upon the child, and that only the only course left to the court is to deliver her into the custody of her mother. Your Honor, in view of this report... Your Honor, I... what now, Mr. Williams? Before this uh, railroad station closes, <laughs> may I question the author of this report? That's your privilege, if you insist. I do. Miss Singleton. Will you tell the court if you ever saw me hit my daughter? No, of course not. Or deprive her of food, clothing, and schooling? No. Any time you've seen us together, did she seem unhappy? No. Do you think it's a crime for a father to treat his daughter as an equal? Well, there are some authorities. Does she, she show said... signs of vitamin deficiency? Your Honor, am I allowed to get a word in here? Oh, I lost control of this hearing an hour ago. <laughs> Ask him. May I tell you that I came to this courtroom mainly to repudiate that report. Your Honor, that report was filed under oath. I believed it when I wrote it. When was that? Friday. And I could have been trying a murder case this week. Stay with it, Mr. Crumpet. You may be. <laughs> Miss Singleton, am I to understand you're denying your sworn word? Well, Your Honor, I've, uh, I've only just begun to realize how deeply Mr. Williams cares for his daughter. It's obvious to me now that I've spent most of my time investigating the wrong party. I deliberately looked the other way while I allowed Mrs. McCormick to use me for her own purposes. But it's finally clear now that she has no real affection for her own child. Her only purpose was to hurt Mr. Williams. Miss Singleton, are you in love with Mr. Williams? Your Honor, is that relevant? I claim it's the only question now that is relevant. Well, Miss Singleton? Remind the witness she's under oath. You keep quiet! <laughs> Answer the question, please. Well, I, of course, I, I can't be sure, but uh, I believe the answer is yes. That is all, Miss Singleton. May I say something else? Is there anything else to say? Yes, there is, Your Honor. No matter what my feelings are about Mr. Williams, he is still no fit father for a little girl. Sometimes love isn't enough. Believe me, it would be a tragic mistake to leave Carol in his sole custody. I am halting these proceedings right now until further notice. I shall assign another probation officer, a man, Miss Singleton. And until his report's completed, Carol shall remain a ward of the juvenile court. You will pick up the child tomorrow at her dwelling and deliver her to the children's center. Step down, Miss Singleton. This court finally is adjourned. <laughs> Well, I'd be happy to blow this place. Yeah. I hope we can sleep without those bells clanging over us. I can always bang my head against a wall. <laughs> Look, Junior, everything's going to turn out all right. It's eight to five we'll be back together again. Why don't we just duck out? How far is it to Rochester? You mean my friend with the bar and grill? Why not? I don't want them to take me away from you. No, nah, you can't run away from life, honey. It always catches up with you. We're leaving here just in time. Living in a church is ruining you. Now, come on. Alice is probably waiting for you. Or is it the church? What's that? Oh, nothing. Steve, don't you want me? Well, there's nothing I want more, but... In spite of anything I can do or you can do, you're getting bigger every day, and it's just a matter of time until your old man's the least important guy in your life. What's that got to do with it? Well, you just got to quit looking at me like I was George Washington, Red Grange, and Florence Nightingale all rolled into one. I don't know all the answers, kid. I... Maybe the judge has a better one. Okay, Coach. After all, you didn't make the world. Yes, I was waiting for Carol just outside the chapel. And then suddenly, the chapel started to fill up. Students and faculty, everybody in school was walking in. And then Father Burke started to talk to me. You have been called to chapel on short notice to give thanks for some extremely good news. St. Anthony's will proceed in its bungling ways down through the years. The province is kind enough to continue its financial aid. The most 
The most difficult thing for a man to admit is that he's growing old. It is an especially difficult thing for an old man to admit it. I now realize that during these past years, I was not trying to save St. Anthony's. I was trying to perpetuate myself in a job that had become too much for me. In my naive attempt to turn this stubborn old school into a money-making operation, I asked Steve Williams to perform an impossible task, and he did it. He did it in his own way, and because he did what I asked him to do. I discharged him from his post, exposed him to public ridicule, and took from him the one thing in life that he valued. I hope that someday he will find it in his heart to forgive me. As for our football team, it will go back to its old ways and its old schedule. And uh, before I hurt anyone else, more especially before I hurt St. Anthony's further, the wisest course for me is to step down. Like our old chapel clock, I've grown picturesque, but not very useful. So, goodbye, and God bless you all. Officer, I, I'm delivering the package again. That's me. Hello, Carol. Hi, Alice. We we were listening to Father Burke. You've got yourself a pretty good character witness, Steve. With my record, I'll need the whole school in court. I hope that someday you'll find a good mother for Carol. That's all either of you need. Yeah, I, I know. I guess we might as well shove off. See you soon, Pop. Yes. Uh, uh, you too? I wouldn't be at all surprised. <laughs> and you still have nice legs for a copper. <laughs> There's a time and place for remarks like that, Mr. Williams. Uh, uh, yes, you're, you're right, Father. All right. Well, welcome to the ranks of the unemployed. Only one of us. You'll be back here again next season. Me? Read the fine print in your contract. It very clearly says that if desired by the college, this agreement may be extended for 12 months. I never saw that. It's in Latin. Oh. <laughs> now, what about that game of Kelly Pool? Come on, Oli, I've got a terrible feeling I'm going to lose my shirt. <laughs> Our stars will return. This is really a story about two people. One is Chief Petty Officer Harry Frame, a veteran Navy electrician who saw lots of action in the war in the Pacific. The other is Mrs. Sadaya Ishiwata of Tokyo. Mrs. Ishiwata turned her home and her fortune over to 53 boys and girls of all ages who were orphaned by World War II. And Chief Frame devoted his off-duty hours to helping this tiny Japanese lady. He organized his friends into work teams, and because of their work, the home took on a bright new look. New panes of glass were installed, a new girl's dormitory was built, and twice a week, a Navy truck rolled up with leftover food, writing paper, worn out clothing, and other contributions from the men. Chief Frame made it his private project toward better relationships between people of two different countries, and it's paid off in mutual goodwill. Such acts by you and your friends today are shaping our world of tomorrow. Now, Mr. Cummings with our stars. June Haver and Jack Austin, would you please step forward and take a bow? <laughs> you know, it's been old home week here for some time. How's that, Irving? It seems that every week at least one of our stars was directed by me in one of his first pictures. And tonight we've broken the spell? Not at all. I directed you in the story of the Dolly Sisters. Remember, June? Mm, yes, I do. It, it was, was the, the last, last pic picture you directed at Fox. <laughs> 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 right. Tell me, now, was I that bad? Now, June, you know you were a great success. As a matter of fact, I received a letter of congratulations from Jenny Dolly herself, thrilled by your, your performance. Then I guess I'm the odd man tonight, eh? Well, Jack, a long time ago, I won't say how long, 
I saw you in a little theater play, and I predicted that you would go far. And so I did, right after that. Went right down to the May Company, got a job in ladies' underwear. How'd you look? <laughs> I thought I looked pretty cute myself. <laughs> You'd better tell us about next week's play, or I had a couple more. <laughs> it's the very moving story of two people who were given an unusual chance for happiness before whose romance was overshadowed by the knowledge that they would never be free of the past. It's Paramount's beautiful love story, September Affair. And as our stars, that fine, sensitive actor, Dana Andrews, and the lovely, talented Eleanor Parker. Well, that's one I certainly don't want to miss. Good night. Good night. Good night. It was wonderful to see you again. Hollywood Radio Theater is a presentation of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.